Now I'm going to sort of move into the second part and talk about how we can know that it could be otherwise is, is a false way of looking at reality. And this is where we use memory. And T.S. Eliot said, this is the use of memory for liberation, not less of love, but expanding of love beyond desire, and so liberation from the future as well as the past. So you can have an experience involving memory that tells you the past could not have occurred otherwise. Now, and that means that the future is already predetermined. The, the, actual, the actualism is confirmed. So let's just do this experiment again. We're gonna, we're gonna toss this in, we're gonna get a two. So leave that there, and we, and we got a two, okay? I mentioned the confirmation of actualism. I call this experience the gold mine of consciousness, and we remember that the past could not have been otherwise. The actual is the only possibility. Now this is beyond science measurement and logic, but it's not illogical. Um, in fact, it's very logical. Now it's unexpected maybe, and maybe it's unpleasant if you want to have free will, but what this actualism tells you is we're here by design, not by chance, randomness, or, or accident, and, that, and instead of probability everywhere, it's probability nowhere. Predeterminism, you're not in control. Now the thing about the past and the future, we, we did this experiment too, and could that have come up? Otherwise, I'm saying no. Um, the, it could not have been otherwise applies to the future also. So whatever happens is already predetermined. Now we tend to think, as did Richard Dawkins, the potential or the possible is much bigger than the actual. We saw Dawkins said, the potential people who could have been here in my place, so massively exceeds the set of actual people because of the DNA combinations. So this is how most of us think. Hey, you know, I, I, I could have slept in. I could have been a contender. Could have gone to a different college. You know, I could, I could order cheese pizza tonight. I could order pepperoni pizza. I could, I could even have spaghetti. So this is how we think. But there's no evidence, of course, that the possible or the potential is actually greater than and the actual, the actual is based on what's really here and now. I had a cheese pizza last night, that's actual. I didn't have pepperoni, that's potential, there's no evidence I could have had pepperoni. So what memory tells us is the potential and the possible equals the actual. It shrinks that whole cloud of possibility to the actual, it merges them. So, that gets us to free will. We all agree that you cannot affect the past. What's done is done, remember, remember that? Your mother tells you, you don't cry over spilled milk, okay? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. You know, he broke, oh, now, now let's cry. Humpty Dumpty's not gonna put himself back together. You cannot affect the past. Now what actualism tells you is you cannot affect the future either. There's a symmetry there. So we go from Murphy's Law, which is whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. The can, of course, being huge, and the, the will being small. We go from that to whatever will go wrong, can go wrong. Or the only thing that can happen is what will happen. So you look at the future and you say, okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna decide to go to a movie tonight, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about going to eight different movies, and we're gonna sit there, and we're gonna look at all these papers and come up with all the ads, and I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to movie number three. And what I'm saying is if you go to movie number three, then you could have not gone to any of those other movies. So don't cry over spilled milk applies to the future and the past. Now, the idea that I don't have any free will is something that most of us abhor. And uh, Dennett, who is the philosopher that we just saw, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, he's a cognitive philosopher, and he actually understands a lot more about free will and determinism than a lot of the biologists, because he's a, he's a philosopher. That's what they're, they're supposed to think. Okay, now, he says, I am prepared to assume that actualism is false, and this assumption is independent of the determinism-indeterminism question, even if I can't claim to prove it, if only because the alternative would be to give up and go play golf or something. 
Now, Dan Dennett, he happens to live very close to where I live, and I've got a set of golf balls on my shelf with his name on them. Because I suggest that Dan Dennett go play a little golf. The second one, Max Born, a world without free will would be quite abhorrent. The third bullet, you may have seen the movie Serendipity with John Cusack and Kate Beckinsale. Uh, Molly Shannon, who's playing the character Eve, she says to Kate Beckinsale, if everything's determined, why should we get out of bed in the morning? Okay? Why bother studying if it's predetermined? Why bother doing anything? And in fact, I have a lot of friends who think like that. And my response to them is, if you don't get out of bed in the morning, you will starve to death. So let's go back to Dennett for a second. Dennett rejects actualism not because of any quote-unquote proof, but because he doesn't like the implications. And that's fine. He doesn't have to like the implications. Very quickly, the idea of no free will solves a fundamental problem in quantum theory, which John Bell was a very important part of quantum theory. There's a thing called Bell's theorem. He was doing an interview where he said, you know, if, if the physicist doesn't have free will, if the experimenter is not free to make this intervention, then if that is also determined in advance, the difficulty disappears. So these quantum mysteries that are everywhere disappear in this world of superdeterminism. The physicist has no free will. Now, I read an article not too long ago looking at eight explanations for quantum theory. And, and Einstein thought about quantum. He said he thought about it 100 times more than he thought about relativity. So there were the eight explanations for why quantum theory and quantum mysteries and all that, but none of them talked about superdeterminism and John Bell, which is very simple and it rejects free will. But you know, the reason they didn't talk about John Bell, they left, they put all these other eight explanations in, and one of them was the multiverse. You've heard about that. There's all kinds of parallel worlds out there. They didn't talk about John Bell because they don't like the idea that there's no free will. Now, I said Dan Dennett rejects actualism because he doesn't like to be chained in. Uh, he wrote a book called Elbow Room, and it was called The Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting. Now, you know what elbowing is in basketball? Okay, so when you go like this and you sort of like swing your elbows a little bit too much. Now, Dan Dennett's a, a very tall, tall fellow, and I, I saw him speak once, and I've met him a couple times, and he wants to have elbow room. You know, he wants to be able to, hey, the actual is small and the potential is big, and I've got this elbow room to go, you know, play around with my free will. Now, he rejects that, obviously, but if you have no free will, then you, you get free from the past, and you have a totally different view of regret, remorse, guilt, and the what-ifs in the, in the past. Now, you didn't study for that test and you got an F, Sorry, but you could not have done otherwise. So forget about it and move on. You did something stupid, move on. You could not have done otherwise. So that whole, I could have done otherwise, that, those ghosts haunt us. And I think Dostoevsky wrote an entire novel about a character who was haunted by an act of cowardice. So he spent his whole life regretting something stupid he had done. 